Hello, everyone. Um, just a very quick bit about me. So I'm Chief Technology Officer at uh, Paramus, and I've spent quite a long time working with OSGI. Uh, I do work in the IoT Expert Group, which I'm a co-chair of, um, and I've been doing lots of stuff with asynchronous systems and with enterprise OSGI for quite a long time. I even have a book. But what we're here to talk about are transactions, and particularly transactions in software. And these have been going for a long time. I mean, like the early 60s was when this stuff uh, started coming around. And it was really there to make sure that you had data integrity. And that's what transactions were for. So they had special operating systems. I mean, we talk about having, oh, I've got to use a particular transaction manager. This wasn't a particular transaction manager. This was like your whole computer was built specifically to process these transactions. You had to run custom software, the whole stack. You know, no, no Linux here. This is, this is old school. And they weren't the transaction systems that we would think of today. This was normally what you would call offline batch processing. So you'd gather up data for a big long period of the day, and then overnight you'd do a load of work to reconcile the data that had come in with what needed to be put into the database. So now, when we talk about transactions, we're usually thinking about something that's real time or near real time, by which I mean when you book your seat on a, on a plane, you kind of expect the ticket to be yours within a couple of seconds, and you don't, definitely don't expect them to be able to sell that ticket twice. So very different. So having these individual updates where suddenly these systems needed to be able to do stuff in real time is where we actually get ACID from. So ACID is all about trying to make sure that you can do these things simultaneously and not have them trample all over each other. And I know everyone loves to talk about NoSQL and just how, how great it can be, but Transactions and relational databases are still a vital tool in our industry. Anyone who says that they're going away is, is wrong. You know, yes, there are plenty of places they've been used where they probably shouldn't have been, and there's a good reason to have different kinds of data store. But sometimes what you have is relational data, and if you've got relational data, a relational database is probably the right way to store that. So, Talking about these transactions, originally it, we're talking about imperative control. This is direct calls to say, you will start now, you will stop now, you will do this now. And that's just because that's how we thought about programming in those days. It was, you know, I'm going to directly tell the system what I want to do right now. You know, coming from the assembly we saw in the keynote, it's, I want you to move this value into this register. You're not talking in high level, you're saying, do this. The problem is you have to do that really, really carefully, because if you make a mistake, then there's nothing going to help you. And trying to do this, it's verbose. It fills your code with cludge. And it's really error prone. People get this wrong a lot. And that's why we came up with declarative transactions. So declarative transactions are all about making this easier. And it's all saying, I'll put some metadata on to say where I want the transaction boundaries to be. And then someone who gets you know, paid to do this can write the code once and make sure that they've done it right. You've got no boilerplate left because it's all been taken away by just this piece of metadata. And you're not worried about mistakes because sooner or later you'll find all the bugs in the transaction manager implementation and it, it will all work properly. So this is, this is good. Uh, talking about the history of declarative transactions, did anyone here use EJB1? Yeah, a couple of people. Despite, it, it was pretty horrible, but it was simpler. I, people talk about how bad it was, but it, it was still better than what came before it. It just still wasn't very good. The Spring Framework came along and basically said, OK, EJBs, those, those were bad. They, they, you know, they got partway to the solution and then kind of collapsed before they crossed the line. So we're going to fix that with aspect-oriented so they, they then later added annotations with Spring 2.5, where they started adding Java 5 support for things. And EJB3 then came along and said, yeah, you're right, that's probably what we should have done, and grabbed all of the uh, AOP stuff and all of the annotation-driven stuff. 
You've now got CDI, which is kind of like the next level of this, and again, is stealing a whole load of concepts from Spring to basically say, wouldn't it be nice if we could just inject everything everywhere and have all of the life cycles be managed and have all of the transactions be managed? So it may seem that we've, you know, we've got the perfect solution. Why is this guy here talking about transaction management? Surely this is a solved problem by now. Because you can't really, at least at first glance, get simpler than saying, this thing is transactional, do my method. They are very simple when you look at them, but what we've done is we've traded some visible complexity where we had this big mass of code for invisible, in, invisible complexity. Because who can tell me what's actually happening when this method is called? And the answer is nobody, because nobody knows what container you're in to start with. So it is a lot better that we're not directly driving the transaction manager and saying, do this stuff. But it's pr usually a pretty good idea to know who is driving your car and how many drinks they've had before they got in front of the wheel. You know, it, this is important stuff. So we need to know a little bit about how these declarative transactions actually work. And so you've got to start them somehow. You know, it's not total magic. The annotation doesn't do stuff by itself. Somebody, somewhere, is running code that's managing this life cycle. And if they weren't, then there would be no transaction. And so that, this is where we come across the concept of aspects, which are the A in AOP. And they're basically running before and after every method call. That's what these aspects do. And they run in one of two ways. So either the container actually weaves bytecode into your method calls, into the instructions in your class, so their, their code becomes your code. Or they create a proxy which wrappers your code and that gives them the opportunity to get around your method calls. And that, that's how it happens. There are different advantages and drawbacks to those two things. Uh, so proxying works really, really well if you've got interfaces. If you're using an interface, then a proxy is really easy to do, and it works quite well. If you've got a final class, though, or any final methods on a class, or even private methods, then sorry, out of luck. You can't proxy those things. It just can't be done, the, the VM stops you. So therefore, you end up in a situation where you've got methods that you can't apply these annotations to. So that's already a bit of a kind of, oh, when can I do it, when, I, when can't I? Also, if you've got uh, a proxy in the way, you can't ever cast to instance type. Now, I know you shouldn't do that, but if you are in a situation where previously there was code that was doing it, and you add a proxy into the mix, then again, that will break, and it will break in a bad way. Object identity is no longer the same either. You can have uh, something which is the unwrapped bean and is the proxy bean, and they're no longer equals equals, even though they are technically the same thing. So identity hash maps can get a bit confused, and again, it, it doesn't always just give you quite what you'd expect. Now, weaving has none of these problems. <clears throat> On the other hand, it does need either you to pre-deploy and weave the stuff in as part of your build step or part of a deployment step, or you have a custom class loader that's going to do it on the fly. So there's work here, which you don't have with proxying. And also, I don't know how many of you have seen this, but it seriously screws around with the Java debugger. If you've ever been trying to step over the first line of your method, and you hit step over and nothing happens, and then you hit step over and nothing happens, and then about 10 minutes later, finally, you reach the first line of your method. That's, that's what's happened. Someone's woven a whole load of code in. And because you don't want to mess around with the line numbering that everyone else has got from the source that they've compiled, you just stick it all before the first line of the method. Yeah, it's, it's a pain. But that's what's happening when that happens. And then we've got a big problem with weaving, which is that actually it provides an <coughs> inconsistent experience. So if people choose proxying and people pr choose weaving, you can tell the difference, and you can tell the difference in particularly unpleasant ways. And we'll talk about that, but in a little bit. The first thing we need to do is actually talk about the rest of the transaction cycle. So we've seen how we can start and stop them, but that's only part of the problem. Because starting a transaction, fine, the transaction started. 
In order to actually do something with the transaction, we need our resources to enlist. If our resources don't enlist in the transaction, they're not part of it, there's nothing that you can do. And that's not just for databases, you know, not relational data, it's you know, JMS or any other resource that you want to be part of the transaction needs to be enlisted in the transaction. And unless that happens, you're out of luck. Your, your data access will not be transactional. So this happens transparently to code using the resource, but it only happens transparently if the right resource is used. If you use the wrong resource, then I'm sorry, no, no transactions for you. And this is why you have to use JNDI when you're in an app server. And it's because the app server has created this amazing special resource that you can use with all the right wrapping to make sure it gets enlisted in the transaction. And if you don't use it, then bad stuff happens. And this is true even if you're not talking about Java EE. This is still true in Spring. In Spring, you have to make sure that you're using a database connection that is enlisted with the Spring tra uh, Platform Transaction Manager. Even if you do that by sticking the magic annotation that says, Spring, make all this happen for me, you still need to tell Spring that it's got to do that. And if you don't, then it doesn't work. So now the proxying problem. I was talking earlier about weaving and proxying and saying, well, so proxying is usually the solution people go for. And the reason people go for proxying as a solution is that it's much less invasive. People don't like having their code rewritten because the code that you test is kind of the code that you want to run, right? And we said it's inconsistent. So weaving gives us a different behavior. Well, so consider the following two methods. We've got a uh, do check and update that supports transactions and makes a call to do update, which requires a transaction. So do we think that you know, that code is fine? Anyone think there might be problems with that code? Particularly, does the requirement hold here? We've got a comment saying there must be a transaction. And the problem we've got here is that actually the aspects I was talking about earlier, they can only run when you call the proxy, because the proxy is the thing that holds the aspects. So in the method we showed, the proxy wasn't being called. We were making a call on ourselves. So that do update call is not calling the proxy. So do update doesn't actually always run in a transaction because we've got supports here which says you can come in and there's no transaction and that's fine. And then we call do update and there's still no transaction because that's what the proxy says. Switching to weaving will change this behavior. You will always have a transaction around the do update method. But you shouldn't be at the whim of the container implementation as to how your transaction boundaries are defined because that's not good. You know, that, that is, in fact, the worst thing you can have. Transactions, you need to know where it starts and you need to know where it stops. Those are really important things because they determine how you, how you scope your business logic. Your application should not need to care that there are these two implementations. So. Going back to transactions, we talked a lot about starting and enlisting. So we've also got the uh, issues with rolling back. So rolling back a transaction is actually quite an important thing. People, people optimize for the success case, which is good, but you do actually need to think about the failure case because the whole point of having a transaction is to make sure that data remains consistent when something goes wrong. So the most obvious reason that you would trigger a rollback is that a method throws an exception. We're kind of used to that, right? Java EE decided to do something pretty odd. And when I say odd, I mean really stupid. Unchecked exceptions trigger rollback. This is good. Checked exceptions do not trigger rollback. What? So the rationale was that if you've got a checked exception, it's listed on your method, as, and therefore it forms part of your API. You know, and if it's part of your API, the person should be handling it, so clearly the transaction boundary is right. You know, you just, that's a valid return value from your method. This is a horrible thing, a really terrible thing to do to people. You should never, ever, ever use exceptions for control flow. They are not a mainline path through your application. They are the something has gone wrong help path through your application. 
So checked exceptions not triggering rollback is a really terrible thing, particularly because SQL exception is a checked exception. How many times have you seen someone say, throws SQL exception, therefore I should not roll back the current transaction because clearly everything is OK? It, oh, this was a terrible decision someone made. So what can we do? Well, as I've said, I don't think, the, I don't think declarative transactions are 100% positive. They're definitely better than things that went before, but they're not perfect. Because our code is simpler, but it's not always correct. And I would say, as, as when it comes to performance, correctness is more important than speed. Because if your code is wrong, then it doesn't really matter how fast it goes. And we've traded this visible complexity for invisible complexity. And complexity is something that we have to deal with, but it's much better if we make sure that we do what we can to make sure it doesn't overwhelm us, but to also know that it's there and where it is. So a modular system has to do better than this. A modular system can't just expect this stuff to you know, be handled transparently by somebody. We need to express dependencies on the features we need. We need to take responsibility for what is happening. We need to be able to rely on the contracts that are being offered to us. And we need to be able to cope when there isn't a central container or when parts of the central container disappear. Also, let's fix the horrible, horrible transaction behavior on, on exceptions, because that, that stuff's just wrong. And this is where OSGI came in with the transaction control service. So transaction control has two main goals, make it simple make it modular. So modular resources means you can add in new resources, you can swap resources, and the rest of the application doesn't need changes. And then simple is pretty obvious. So what does this actually mean? Well, you tell transaction control what scope you want to have for your transaction, and you tell your resources which transaction control service they should be enlisting with. From there, everything else can follow. But what we've done is we've done the necessary bit to say, I'm not looking for magic behind the scenes. This is how it should be set up. From there, I, you're now following your contracts. And that's a good thing. So it's a functional API. Your business logic is be basically being passed as a function to run within a scope. And your scopes can be transactional or non-transactional. Transaction control basically has four well-known options that I'm sure people will be familiar with. Things like required, requires new, supports, and not supported. And those are all fairly well-known options. But given I've said that there are transactional and non-transactional scopes, it should be obvious that a scope isn't just a transaction. It does a bit more than that. And it's basically some context for your work. So you've got a place to store state, a place to register completion callbacks, uh, access boundary for your resources. And this is pretty cool, because it means that you can access resources without worrying about how they leak, because you never really need to worry about when you're getting the database connection. You lazily retrieve it the first time you use it within a scope. So it's not enlisted in your transaction. It's not part of your transaction to start with until you use it. And then the same resource is available to you throughout the entire scope which is pretty awesome as well. And then finally, we can get rid of it when the scope ends, because we've got a defined boundary for it. We know when it's no longer available, so we can get rid of it. We can release it. And you don't have to do any of this yourself. So when does a scope finish? Quite simply, the scope ends once your function has returned. Resource cleanup happens regardless of whether this was successful or not. You're not having to do try catch and say, oh, there was an exception coming out, so clean it up. We know the scope is over. And then the value you return from your scope is what returned out. So there's some additional rules where if you've got transactional work, you can mark a scope for rollback, at which point it will always roll back regardless of how it completes. If it exits with any kind of exception, it will roll back. Normal return values will obviously allow the transaction to commit. You can mark specific exception types not to cause rollback, because there are still pieces of code out there that do throw exceptions as part of the API that do mean something, and you still need to commit. You shouldn't really need to use them, but it's important 
to give people the option. So that's scopes and their life cycle. So the thing that we've got to interact with a scope is called a scoped resource. Because creating a scope on its own isn't that valuable. I mean, you can do some stuff, you can do some callbacks, but it's only when you start involving resources that it gets really fun. And a scope resource is created from a resource provider, which is a uh, pretty simple interface. It contains exactly one method, and you basically ask the resource provider to give you its resource. You would typically not use this interface directly. You would use a more specialized subtype. And the reason for that is because it gives you type safety, which is a good thing. We should not have to call something which returns an object and say, oh, cast this to a database connection. The 90s were a long time ago. So JDBC connection provider gives us a Java SQL connection. A JPA entity manager provider gives us a JPA entity manager. Um, and the thing about this returned object is it is a thread safe proxy. So it is not a raw database connection. It is a proxy to a database connection. And that means you can just use it in your methods whenever you need it. You're not worried about when do I need to get a new database connection? When, how do I ensure that I'm using the same database connection? That is not a problem. You can just use it, and because you've associated it with the transaction scope, you know that wherever in your code you're using this resource provider, you will have the same database connection within the same scope. And if you've got different scopes, you'll have different database connections. So assembling it all together is actually uh, pretty easy. So I'm hoping at least some of you are familiar with declarative services, because it's usually the most compact way to write an example. Uh, but you can see here we've got a transactional declarative services component. It's being injected with the transaction control service. It's being injected with an entity manager provider. And when it's starting up, then you're getting hold of this proxy to some, um, some entity manager you're going to use at runtime. And then in your do update method, you say, I've got a required piece of work. And in that scope, I'm going to persist something into the database. And then actually, I don't have a return value, so I can just return null. But we've got here a scoped piece of work that is running within a transaction. And we've been really explicit about what the behavior should be. There's no magic annotation there. There's nothing that says, oh, how is this going to work in a test container? Your code is saying explicitly what it wants to happen. So we inject the services, thanks to DS, create the scope resource, use the scope resource. No cleanup, no commit to worry about. It's just there. So that's the basics, which I think are already pretty cool, but there are some more advanced features as well. So most resource types, I'm thinking here things like uh, the entity manager we had there, a Java SQL connection, a JMS connection, have a programmatic API that you can use to do things like commit and rollback. And this is only going to apply to a single resource, so it's usually known as a resource local transaction. And you can use those, great. But if we've got multiple resources in our transaction, we kind of need more than that. So the XA protocol is here to give us a uh, state machine, which basically gives us a distributed transaction. So transaction control supports these resource local transactions. But you can also get hold of an XA-enabled one using the uh, OSGI XA-enabled property on the service. So you can have XA transactions and just not have to worry about in your code what's happening. You just use a service implementation that supports XA. The API is the same, whatever you're doing. Connection pooling is also an important thing. So I think most people understand why you want to pool database connections. But connection pooling in OSGI can actually be quite hard. And it's because the pooling implementation tends to try to load the driver directly. And that means that you, uh, you end up with the client either directly coupled to the pooling implementation as they try to assemble it, but calling the API directly or the pooling implementation blows up when it tries to load a driver that it doesn't import. So the resource provider is a really good place to actually fit this. So JDBC connection provider has built-in support for J, uh, JDBC connection pooling. You've got a standard factory service that you can use. You can also use configuration admin. But it defines this for you and sets it all up. And you don't need to worry about the details. I mentioned that we had a no rollback for. 
So when you start a transaction, you can actually nominate some exception types that are going to trigger or not trigger rollback. Uh, you can see here, all it is, is is a simple builder, which allows you to define some exceptions that shouldn't, uh, but some that also should. For example, you can see connect exception actually is a socket exception. And in this case, you won't roll back for socket exceptions, except if they are connect exceptions. So you can, you can build up the kind of behavior you actually want. But again, you're being explicit because you're managing what you really want to happen, rather than applying a small amount of metadata and hoping you get what you want to happen. Do be careful when you use this. It's usually an indication that your, your API is a bit of a mess. Uh, then uh, another thing we can talk about, nesting scopes. So people talk about nested transactions, and normally the, the, JDP, normally the uh, JTA people say, oh, you can't do that. Well, actually, you can nest scopes pretty easily. Uh, so you can do a com quick commit partway through a batch, uh, you can query for some sequence numbers outside the current transaction so you don't end up locking a table for a long time. Uh, and that's basically because each scope is entirely isolated from the other. It uses a totally different resource instance. Uh, you've got separate, uh, separate context, separate lifecycle callbacks. These things are just independent of one another. So you can start one from inside another, and that's fine. Uh, you can also query and see what kind of scope have I got. Uh, but let's actually take a look. I think it's important to uh, show people some code when you're claiming that this stuff actually works. Hopefully, uh, you'll also be pleased to see that I'm actually using something you're going to be learning about in the next session, uh, which is the uh, JAXRS whiteboard. So you can see here we have a really simple uh, JAXRS resource. And we're being injected with a transaction control service and a JPA entity manager provider. Now, in this case, I've put a target filter on it to specifically select the persistence unit that I want. Uh, and you can see, basically, this is just the code that I showed you earlier. But in here, you can see I've got a nice, simple CRUD service which is using JAXRS. And what I can actually do is I can launch this. And you can see here that I'm able to add something successfully. I can list the things that I've added. So I'm just calling really, really simple uh, method calls on a uh, standard RESTful service, and I'm able to do persistence and obviously delete things as well. And the total, uh, the total lines of code for this thing uh, in my you know, not very elegant uh, JAXRS is significantly under 100. And this is doing full create, update, delete with JPA. Uh, I've got a message entity, which is pretty much the entirety of my data model, uh, which you can see I've also uh, annotated with various uh, JAXB annotations so that we can uh, serialize it easily. But this, this whole, whole project ended up being, what, 120 lines? I know it's a bit naughty, but equally, it's doing everything you'd want from a transactional application with code that you can download and use today. So just quickly back to the presentation, because I've been told there's something that I do need to uh, show you guys. So if you are interested in seeing some more about this stuff, uh, then you can look at transaction control is an upcoming OSGI spec. Uh, there's actually a prototype of it out and available now um, in Apache Ares. There's been a couple of releases. It's available in Maven Central. So the code I was showing you right there, all of the infrastructure code is available, released right now. Hi, um, I'm Elju, and um, I would like to know, um, I was dealing with Hibernate a lot, and uh, you know, the transaction management with Hibernates in the last two, three years was not that efficient uh, concerning OSGI. Yep. And uh, my, my question is, um, 
how how do you how do you go through this whole transaction process with the and uh, with the ORM like uh, Hibernate? Is there any uh, examples or with Eclipse Link uh, or the um, uh, other entity uh, entity manager? So I'm just going to go back and uh, show you the list of run bundles that I had in my launch configuration. So I, can, you, uh, can you see those? Yeah. So the example I'm showing you right now is Hibernate. Hibernate, there's a whole bunch of tests that demonstrate Hibernate working both resource local and XA in the Apache Ares project. So there's, uh, you, you can look at the integration tests, which show you deploying and actually using persistence units. Uh, there are also examples in the uh, OSGI en route repository on GitHub. So yes, you can do it. Yes, it really works. My live demo. That's great. It's, it's great to hear about it. Um, now, my other question is concerning, um, the, the, you know, OSJ, it's all about dy dy dynamic hot swapping. And uh, I would like to know if the same works with the entities uh, inside of Hibernate. When you modify, like, your uh, entity, your object value, how does it work into dynamically hot swapping those entities inside of the... GTA transactions and inside of all the, the whole process? So your entities live inside an OSGI bundle. And if you're updating that OSGI bundle, then one of the things that will happen is that, that oh, it, the things that were connected to that OSGI bundle will keep being connected it, to it until you do something called a package refresh, which basically allows you to evict the old version from the runtime. So. Typically, what happens when you do an update is you'll do an update and a refresh. You'll put a new version of the entities in, and you'll essentially unresolve a bunch of bundles. So it's dynamic in that the system as a whole stays up, but the individual things that were wired to the entity package will be unresolved and then re-resolved to the new version, and that's what will then be used. So it, your persistence unit will get closed and will come back up, but the system as a whole won't go down you'll end up with brief outage while effectively the, the system re-resolves. Yeah. Okay, so that's one. Um, the, so it, it means that it, it works also. That's, that's what I'm hearing. Yes. Is that correct? It works. It, what you won't get is you won't get the kind of continuous availability that you'd get with just a transparent service switch, because you're talking about actually taking away a package from the runtime. Okay. But you will get, dyna you will get dynamic behavior, okay. and you will, your, your system doesn't need to be restarted. OK. And l let's say that I'm, I'm, I'm in a use case, and I'm, I have an entity which is mapped as a superclass, and, uh, and I have another entity which is like extending that uh, mapped uh, superclass. What happens when I modify the, 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 the mapped superclass or the other one? How is it handled? So if you've got the mapped superclass and it's in the same bundle as the, uh, the rest of the entities, then all of the entities are going to get recycled at the same time. If it's in a different bundle, then you start to put yourself in a more complex scenario. But effectively, if you take away the super type, then you're removing that package, which will force the other bundle to unresolve when you do the package refresh. So the whole thing will get pulled down, and the whole thing will come back up. But you, uh, whenever you take away a bundle, and by uninstalling it effectively, or by updating it, you take away the revision then things will keep using it until you do the refresh. When you do the refresh, anything that was connected to it will be unresolved and re-resolved. So all the class loaders get thrown away. All the instances should be thrown away by people who are effectively stopped. So that's, that's the way it's handled. Because it's, it's just the same as it would be for any other type. Entities aren't special in that way.